e ngā uri o ngā awe ko koutou e nau mai nei, e nau mai nei ki tēnei papa hotanga tēnā koutou katoa. Nau mai hāre atua ko mihi tu ārangi. Kia koutou kua tau mai nei, o ti rā kia o tatau tini mate, kua hāre i te ara o matoro nuku, wa tau atu i te pukawai nui i te whakātoa o rehua, te taumata o rehua, te hui hui ngā o matariki. Hoki atu e te pōwha i ariki, nau mai a te o maramati, he wa mauri ora, Kia tātou katoa. Welcome, uh, one and all, to this very special webinar on geographical indicators. An important hui for iwi, for Māori, uh, for those involved in the food production industry, indeed for Māori business. Aroha mai, aroha atu. This is an educational webinar for New Zealand Māori food producers, iwi agencies and other Māori businesses who are interested in focusing on geographical indicators. We will discuss the pros and cons of geographical indicators and the potential for Māori businesses and other interested parties. Ko Julian Wilcox, I hope, no ngā pohi, ngā tūtū wharetoa. Me tarawa, my name is Julian Wilcox and I'll be facilitating this webinar today and it is my privilege to be involved in this webinar and also to introduce to you soon our key presenters, our key speakers on this issue. We'll be hearing soon from uh, Raimondo Serra, the European Commission Directorate General for Agriculture, who will introduce the concept of geographical indicators. And Raimondo will also update us on where trade negotiations are up to in regard to geographical indicators now. And then we will hear from Lanel Tafri Hudia, an Indigenous law and intellectual property expert at AJ Park, who will answer some questions relating in the main to the report she co-authored on Māori interests and geographical indicators, looking at strategic intellectual property management, enabling Māori whānau development. Now, this report was written on behalf of a group called Te Taumata, uh, the government's first port of call for trade discussions with Māori. Uh, with a network of more than 700 whānau followers, Te Taumata works with Māori businesses to, to deliver better trade outcomes for Māori and a more prosperous future for whānau Māori and their communities. This is a wide-ranging discussion, ladies and gentlemen, on a range of questions with both our speakers, uh, following which those of you who are watching this webinar will have the opportunity to ask questions of our key presenters and speakers. And you can post those questions using the chat functions on the platforms that we are streaming on, uh, which is on YouTube and other platforms as well. So please feel free to log those questions with us and we will endeavour to try and post those questions and pose those questions to our speakers when the opportunity arises. Uh, we'll ask our guests for some summary comments before we conclude and that should happen at about 11.15, 11.30 and uh, we have a fair amount of time to be able to, to post the questions to our speakers so please log those in. And don't forget we will also be recording a video recording this webinar today and we will make that available and upload that to LinkedIn and Facebook for later viewing and referral. So let's introduce our presenters, our panellists for this webinar today. Firstly I'd like to introduce uh, joining us, I think from Brussels actually, uh, Raimondo Serra, the European Commission Directorate General for Agriculture. Raimondo leads the European Union team negotiating agricultural components of the EU-NZ Free Trade Agreement. He's been the EU lead negotiator for agricultural and geographical indications, uh, components of the FTAs, including the EU and Canada, and the EU and US, and EU and Japan. Our second presenter, who's here with me uh, in Wellington at the moment, is Lanelle Tuffery Hudia. She is an Indigenous law and intellectual property expert at AJ Park. Heuri no Ngati Ruanui, me Nga Ruahine. She is a trademark specialist working with a diverse range of clients around the world. Lanelle has particular expertise and experience in Indigenous law and protecting cultural icons. As an expert on Indigenous law and intellectual property issues, uh, Pacific Island countries, Linnell manages AJ Park's presence in the Pacific. She specialises in advising Māori organisations on IP issues and protecting their cultural icons, among her most interesting cases, has been working with Pātea Māori Club to safeguard the group's Poirier trademark and other aspects of its IP. Those are her Taranaki relations. 
Thank you very much for joining us. Rondo, thank you for joining us from overseas. And also, Linnell, thank you for being here. Really good to have you both part of this webinar. Ramondo, if I can now start with you and ask you and give you some time to discuss and present what geographical indications are and why they are important in EU trade negotiations with New Zealand. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi from Brussels. Uh, it's a late evening uh, in Brussels. I understand uh, it's uh, early morning in New Zealand. I'm more than pleased to be with you today and uh, to share uh, my personal beliefs and my points of view uh, as an EU negotiator on the EU system on geographical indications. Uh, but before starting uh, to enter in, in the matter, just allow me to uh, share with you some uh, biography uh, regarding myself. I'm not only uh, an EU official, I'm, uh, I'm Italian. I'm uh, from Sardinia, more precisely. So for the ones of you not knowing what Sardinia is, Sardinia is an island. And so we have uh, some similarities with New Zealand in that respect. And we do have another similarity in Sardinia with New Zealand. Uh, there are more sheep than human beings. Uh, our ratio is uh, one to two. Uh, I understand that the ratio in New Zealand uh, is a bit more compelling when it comes to sheep. But this is to say that uh, we understand what being an islander mean and uh, what means having uh, nice products uh, around uh, our beloved islands. Um, when it comes to geographical indications, uh, I could start by uh, sharing with you the official definition that we, uh, we have in the TRIPS agreement, uh, uh, which is, uh, in a way, rather boring, if I can say so. Uh, I would prefer to start in a different manner if I manage to share with you my screen. I hope this is the case. AGI is uh, the conjunction of uh, two entities, two realities. On one side, we have a geographical area. Uh, in uh, the pictures that are in the slides, uh, you see some vineyards, uh, some cellars, and some bottles. Uh, those uh, uh, pictures are taken in a rather uh, known uh, place in France. And uh, another example of uh, geographic area is the one in the Alps, uh, referring to uh, abundance, uh, which is, by the way, also an animal breed, a cow breed. But when you have a combination of a geographical area a specific product being uh, a sparkling wine or a cheese, and not only there is a geographical area and a specific product, but there is a link between one and two, then the magic happens, you have a geographical indication. In the EU, we have understood that concept uh, uh, already uh, some time ago. Uh, in the early 90s, we have established a new system of protected destination of origins and protected geographical indications. Uh, you have the logos, uh, which serves uh, as a, 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 an identifier for the consumers of those products. And we cover food, uh, we cover wine, and we cover spirits uh, with those specific uh, uh, law regimes. And uh, in the next slide, you can see uh, just uh, a, a very small sample of uh, very famous GIs. Champagne, already named, Parma Ham, the Rioja wine in Spain, the Irish Pochin, uh, Queijo Saint George in Portugal, name it. Um, it's a very widespread concept that uh, it's very cherished to uh, the EU uh, citizens and consumers and producers, because it brings benefits not only to producers, not only to consumers, but to the society as a whole. Looking at the GIs from the perspective of producers, uh, clearly uh, the big advantage is that a name, which is recognized as being a GI, 
is reserved to products conforming to certain specifications, but can be used by all producers respecting those specifications. So in that respect, it's clearly a collective intellectual property right as opposed to a private one. And for producers, it is also very, very interesting the fact that uh, they don't have to spend their uh, days and nights fighting for their rights in courts. Uh, there is an administrative protection ensured by public authorities uh, in order to prevent uh, that those terms are used by non-qualified producers. But if I have to select one uh, feature that uh, makes uh, GIs particularly important to producers is the fact that the market recognizes a better price to GIs as compared to a standard product. A recent study uh, established the magic average of 2.23 times the price of a standard product, but we have uh, uh, stunning examples of 1 to 10 between a commodity and a geographical indication. Uh, and that allows what is very, very interesting from a producer perspective, which is to keep along the food chain the most of the added value for producers instead of that for the other uh, chains in the, in the food chain. But consumers are also uh, equally important. Uh, they get from GI the fact that uh, when they buy a geographical indication, they know the origin of the product. They know that that product has a certain quality, which is enshrined in the specifications, and they know that the product they buy is authentic. There is no imitation, or if there is an imitation, the uh, authorities take actions against uh, those uh, counterfeited products. But as I said, this is not enough. What is equally interesting, in particular from a government perspective as mine, is that geographical indication are important to maintain jobs and activities uh, in rural areas. Uh, they are, in a way, a perfect local product, but they, that local product has the ability to go global if it manages to be successful. Other positive externalities of GIs uh, extend to the fact that, in general, uh, they are uh, sustained uh, in a concept of sustainable agriculture and they uh, promote biodiversity because they are based on uh, traditional knowledge and traditional heritage. Another feature uh, that is important for the society as a whole that uh, along the concept of GI, entire economies of tourism have been based. Uh, it's uh, enough to uh, think about Champagne or Bordeaux in France as wines. Uh, in all those regions, there are very well established tourism routes for wine lovers that can go and profit from wines and at the same time uh, let those rural areas become vibrant, vibrant economically. So GIs are instruments uh, that conserve local uh, cultural heritage and uh, are able to transmit traditional production methods. They are strong marketing tools for farmers and there is a clear added value uh, as compared to uh, the standard products. From a pure IPR perspective, from an intellectual property point of view, uh, GIs are not transferable because they are linked to a given area, so they cannot be displaced as any other uh, intellectual property. They do not expire and they do not need to be renewed, contrary to trademarks, just to name one other intellectual property, right? Given the features that I've just mentioned, uh, they benefit in, EU, in the EU from administrative protection on top of the possibility to go for judicial remedies. And they can coexist with prior trademarks, but they are protected against the registration of subsequent trademarks. So in a way, the EU system gives a priority uh, to um, GIs over trademarks while recognizing the rights of trademark holders. We have more than 3,000 GIs registered. Half of them are essentially wines. Um, then there is another big chunk, which are food products. 
and the rest are spirit drinks and aromatized wines. Just to give an example, uh, which is probably less reputed and less famous than uh, uh, the ones that I've mentioned before, the Ireland Waterford Bla, which is a bread, uh, gained uh, protection in the EU rather recently. And it is a, a very uh, classic example of uh, uh, traditional heritage that it became a geographical indication. Uh, following uh, the GI protection, uh, this product has uh, get, got a major boost in the, uh, uh, in the economy, not only uh, in Waterford, where it is uh, a, a classic feature for tourism, but also uh, uh, around Ireland and beyond. Now you can find Waterford Bla in Irish pubs, in Paris, in Brussels, and around uh, many other big cities in, in the EU. Now let, let me bring very quickly uh, the international dimension of GIs. Uh, GIs are indeed essentially sold locally, nationally, and when it comes to the EU, in the EU market but they have also an international dimension. They are protected in trips uh, as intellectual property rights. There is a basic definition. There is a basic level of protection, which is essentially against the misleading the consumer about the origin of the product. Once the spirits, they get an higher level of protection. They are protected and their use is prevented, even if consumers are not misled about the origin of the product. In a, essence, you can say Parma ham from Australia, but you cannot say uh, Burgundy wine uh, from Australia. And the reason why we attach a lot of importance in our FTAs or in our uh, multilateral dealings uh, in the WTO to GIs is that we do believe that that level of protection, which is differentiated between wine and spirits on one side and the other GIs on the other side, is not warranty, is not fair. We believe that in the GI world, there are not children of a lesser God, and that GIs are not children of a lesser God when it comes to other IPs. So they belong, and they believe, they, they, they deserve the same level of protection that other GIs, and they deserve the same level of protection of other IPs. And this is why we uh, try to achieve, in the context of our FTAs, the same level of protection for all GIs, at the same level of protection of wines and spirits. To, we are open to protect GIs from our FTA partners. Uh, and we want to achieve also the coexistence between GIs with prior trademark registered in good faith. So we believe that the coexistence is possible between those different intellectual property rights. We want, uh, last but not least, uh, to have those rights enforced administratively. Uh, most of the GIs, I would say 90% of the GIs, belong to uh, small farmers and small communities. They don't have uh, the resources to go uh, in court uh, globally to fight for their rights. This is why we believe that administrative enforcement is the most appropriate way those rights should be enforced. Over time, uh, we have uh, managed to have a large network of agreements in force, uh, all concluded, uh, just to name a few, uh, Vietnam, China, Japan, South Korea, Singapore are realities. Mercosur and Mexico just being concluded and Canada concluded a while ago. But we have uh, another important number of GIs uh, negotiations ongoing in the context of our FTA uh, strategy. Uh, there is Indonesia, there is Australia, but there is first and foremost, for the sake of our conversation, New Zealand. Um, with New Zealand, we have uh, uh, made very clear since the very beginning that uh, GI had to be a component of the discussion. Uh, we have tabled a rather comprehensive list of GIs to be protected in that context, more than 2,000, essentially a full list of wine GIs, a full list of spill GIs, and a set of our food GIs for protection in New Zealand based on their economic interest. 
Um, discussions have been progressing rather slowly in the beginning, uh, given uh, the traditional uh, resistance, if I can call it that way, of New Zealand to engage on GIs. Now they have accelerated and we are entering into a phase where a deal is possible. Uh, I will uh, take more than uh, one question in that respect to answer the specifics. Uh, as a result of our FTA network, uh, we do not only have managed to protect our GIs in many countries, we protect more than 1,500 GIs in the EU. So this is to say it's a two-way street, and I believe that the two-way street is definitely open also for New Zealand. This brings me uh, to the end of my uh, short presentation on uh, the concept of GI, and I'm sure that uh, it will pave uh, the way to your questions in the course of this webinar. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and we will come back to you soon. Uh, I want to now turn to our, our guest here, our presenter here, Ranel Tafrihudia. Thank you for coming, Anoha. Tēnā good to have you. Uh, let's get your first opening comments, uh, perhaps even a response to what you've heard from Ramondo. I mean, uh, Ramondo has provided the traditional um, definition for geographical ind indicators, and that's um, what's used around the world and what we would probably we use in New Zealand, or what we do use in New Zealand. Um, you know, the key aspect of that is uh, you know, a link to a geographical location for me, and I think that's very important for Māori because we have that close association with uh, you know, our land, our whenua, our maunga, our rivers, um, and the produce that comes from, from there. So you know, that's a very important link for us, and, and, and GIs appear to fit quite well with our, um, our traditional the traditional, our traditional way of life. For those that haven't read the report, the Tatomata report is, is, a, is a lengthy but very detailed report. It is an informative report, 66 pages, I think it mm -hmm. is, and I would commend the report to you to have a look at. In the report, you also looked at some international examples, some indigenous, inter mm -hmm. uh, sorry, some, some examples that have been uh, raised as uh, previous mm -hmm. um, EU negotiations and free trade agreements. What have you found out of those examples that could be of benefit uh, mm. for geographical indications for Māori? Uh, so, you, just clear, clarify the question. Are you talking about the intellectual property frameworks or the free trade agreements? The, sorry, so the intellectual, the intellectual property frameworks. Yeah, so, uh, I guess intellectual property is a tool that Māori can use, and you know, whether that's trademarks, patents, um, designs, uh, etc., copyright. Uh, and, and GIs is another form of intellectual property right that can um, provide some protection for aspects of um, traditional knowledge, uh, cultural heritage. Um, but the real issue with the, those frameworks is the sort of underlying concepts. And, you know, they, they are traditionally driven from an economic base, whereas when we are looking to protect our cultural heritage, we come at it from a... Um, a cultural base, so our Te Ao Māori view, and which is quite different to that intellectual property framework base. And so that's really where the the issues lie, that sort of the heart of the of the frameworks. But I don't think that undermines the ability to use those tools to protect aspects of our cultural heritage, and they can be used in that way. Right. What international developments have been made in protection of Indigenous rights? And interests. So it's been very slow, and the World Intellectual Property Organisation has been negotiating uh, a text based system that would look at providing uh, explicit protection for um, traditional knowledge, uh, traditional cultural expressions, and genetic resources. And uh, those negotiations have been ongoing since 1990, uh, and Progress has been very slow. Uh, the other fora, I guess, that do provide some protection is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which makes it very clear uh, what rights uh, Indigenous peoples are seeking in relation to their cultural heritage. And, um, you know, the UNESCO also has uh, 
organization has its um, a specific conventions around the protection of cultural heritage as well. So there are some developments. Um, the ne it would be good to see those negotiations at WIPO uh, advance it a little bit quicker from, for Indigenous peoples, um, but they seem to have stagnated and stagnated for quite a while. That's the World Intellectual Property Organisation. Yes, yes. Um, what are the similarities then with the economic position in Europe on geographic in indicators? Uh, so the similarities uh, for Māori are that you know we have um, rule-based um, uh, Fano Hapu Iwi or you know communities uh, that are generating their own uh, intellectual property, um, their own you know they have specific flora fauna um, that has specific characteristics or uh, unique characteristics, and they can um, you know be commercialised in some way to generate uh, some sort of revenue or some sort of economic benefit to that community. Um, so as a consequence, there is a potential uh, for Māori to take advantage of the geographical indication system uh, to you know, protect uh, those unique characteristics of their unique products from their communities uh, and you know, obtain some economic benefit and then return that to their communities to achieve their other goals, well, like their social, cultural, environmental goals that they wish to achieve. I'm sure we're going to get questions on specific examples from people who are watching right now. Uh, one comes to mind immediately, but we'll wait until the audience questions come in. And if you have, have got some questions, please post them and we'll put them to our speakers as well. Um, I want to ask about the Tiriti. What arises under the Tiriti or Waitangi in relation to the European Union's proposals on geographical indicators? Um, so I, I, my understanding is that the free trade agreement, um, you know, our New Zealand's position is to have the treaty exception clause in, in all our free trade agreements. Uh, and so uh, the tribunal has said that that um, clause provides su sufficient protection for, for Māori under the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, I know there are... Uh, organisations and people that disagree with that conclusion and so I think there's an opportunity as part of this process to actually delve into that and, and find out and make sure that we have certainty around that. Um, the other, I, I think the, the other important thing is that the, um, the proposal for, ge for geographical indicators is, is, this, is a tool. It's not going to solve all our issues in relation to under you know, about the Tetriti, um, and so part of in the report we definitely talk about we need to explore those. We need to make sure that that foundation is secure um, as part of or before we launch into the space. So let me just follow on from that, if I may, um, because I think it might be important for people to know. Are we so? So let's take for instance Y two six two Kuala Tene and the recommendations that were made from the Waitangi Tribunal in that report. And my understanding is that it's still being worked through, mm. despite the amount of years that have passed mm. since Kuala Tene mm. that report came out. Is your position that those frameworks should should be in place before we start looking further, um, if possible, mm. uh, to provide some, I guess, assurance, some certainty for Maori yeah. when we look at geographic indicators with the EU negotiations? I mean, I. Ideally, yes, we should have that, you know, should have our domestic situation policy sorted. Um, but I mean, this opportunity, we need to balance that with the opportunity with a, you know, a free trade agreement for, with the EU. Um, there's, you know, there's bigger considerations there. You know, as history um, tells us, Māori have been traders and exporters, you know, long before um, the British arrived here, um, you know, if New Zealand increases its exports, uh, you know, it, what, what's good for New Zealand exporters is good for Māori exporters and Māori business. Um, so there's, there's that, that position that we also need to be careful of. Um, so if we move forward, um, making sure that our domestic policy is secure, making sure that we can continue to ha perhaps have those discussions around our domestic policy, um, while at the same time engaging, it, it's not going to be perfect, but I think there's... Um, you know, we, that's a, a bigger decision and perhaps a, a bigger question for someone of much more qualified than I am. Yep, there's a word that comes to mind a lot when I read the report, to some of the report, 
and when I listen to also the presentation from Ramondo, is, a, is around, and that word is protection. Um, what protections are given to Māori? I, I think of te reo, and use of te reo words. Are there protections given for use of te reo Māori through geographic indications or not? Uh, so in our, I mean, our current, if I look at our current GI framework that we have in New Zealand, there is a specific provision that says uh, if a, a geographical indication includes a Māori word, then it gets referred to the um, Māori Trademark Advisory Committee and they will consider whether the use of that geographical name will be offensive. So there is a level of protection. Uh, you know, it doesn't deal with the uh, other issues of um, whether it's culturally appropriate or not, you know, sort of those lower tests um, that we talked about in the Y262 report, you know, whether it's derogatory, um, you know, that test was, is, is a little bit, is a different test to an offensiveness test. And so there is some protection in there, but in terms of, you know, a more general protection for te reo, no. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's something that we need to, to work on and figure out what, what that domestic policy is around that. I think Ramondo mentioned um, collective management of, of rights. Why might this be of interest to Māori? Yeah, well, that's one of the fundamental issues with the intellectual property system is that it is individual rights-based. And so you have to identify an owner to be out, and that owner has to then enforce um, their IP rights against a third party or misuser. Uh, and a c for Māori, you know, our intellectual property, our indigenous peoples around the world, um, intellectual property is not held by an individual, it's held by the community. Um, you know, the community respects the rules and regulations that apply, or tikanga and kawa that apply um, to the use of that knowledge, um, and that's how it's regulated. It's regulated by the community. And if we think about an example, um, you know, the heitiki, for example, you know, you can't identify a specific whānau, hapu or iwi that owns that heitiki. Um, so how do we in stop misuse and misappropriation of that heitiki? It's very difficult because um, it w in an individual um, ownership regime. But when we have a collective regime where you have acknowledged that there is a community that sort of has input into the regulation of that um, heitiki, then you know you you move to a system that more aligns with a Māori te ao Māori view, so that's one of the advantages of that system. Um, I mean, as under the GI system, you do have to have um, a collective management. You do have to have a structure set up to um, to manage that, and so there does have to be an organisation or an individual, uh, but the organisation regulates itself and, and, find, and, and determines what those regulations are, which uh, is definitely more aligned with... And, with and you, you mentioned that in the report yeah. as well mm -hmm. as a recommendation for consideration. And that comes to the next point, which immediately pops into my mind, particularly when we talk about te reo, we know it is a Polynesian language. Mm. And the derivation of a lot of Māori words come from te mōna mm. mm. So how do we not only protect te reo, but ensure that we also protect the interests of our Pacifica yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. We, we are going to have that, that clashes with, um, you know, our, our, brother, our brothers and sisters from Te Moana Nui Akiwa, and, and um, there is um, scope within the GI framework to have, uh, allow there to be two words, the same word protected by two different organisations that have different characteristics. Um, so there is scope to, to allow for that, but um, we will have to negotiate through that. Okay. Um, not being of high intelligence like yourself or Ramondo, I, I need you to talk me through a term that I read, which is, um, and I'm hoping I get this pronunciation right, um, homonymous geographic indicators. Mm -hmm. What are those? Um, so, I, I mean, I guess that's the example we talked about, right? So That's collective yeah, management. Yeah. Right. Well, well, it's more the... Um, you know, the homonymous is, you know, the same word used um, by different organisations oh, okay. um, and so has different meaning and, and gives different um, 
it gives different, uh, you know, has different characteristics for different organisations. Um, so, you know, that's that, what okay. that's referring to. Come on. I just thought I'd clear that up just to make sure I was on the right track. Um, what about costs? What are the costs for registration for geographical indicators? Are there any ongoing costs as a part of that process? And who pays? Yeah, I mean, in New Zealand's current framework, the, um, the applicant pays. Um, and so they bear the cost of the process of registration. And, um, you know, it's quite expensive. Um, in New Zealand, the official fees are, you know, several, uh, you know thousands of dollars. Um, and, and because it is a complex process, you have to establish, one, the geographical region, you, you know, what is that? Um, get that mapped out. You have to establish what is the, what are the unique characteristics, and demonstrate that there are these characteristics do exist. Um, and so, how do you do that? Um, and so, this, it's quite a lot of work. So there is a, a lot of costs involved. And I do think, um, you know, while the uh, the proposed structure, GI structure, does allow for uh, sort of, um, I've, kind of, I've forgotten the words that Raimondo used, but a, a framework where, you know, it's automatic uh, protection and automatic enforcement. So there's a, there's a, on the, on the owner of the GI, they don't have to go out and enforce it. Um, but our current regime actually does require you to enforce it, which, you know, again, that costs money as well. Ramondo, I know, I know you're, you're on the line with us. Would, would you mind talking through that with us again, please, that automatic process that Linnell is talking about? With pleasure. Um, Linnell is just touching uh, some key points of a GI system. And um, I believe that the, the aspects of cost is particularly relevant to the GI debate and to the communities that are interested to, the, to that debate. Uh, I can only point to the features of the EU system that as a system that is born and raised because of the existence of a number of products uh, since centuries, it's definitely tuned towards the interest of uh, producers in the first place, consumers in the second, and society uh, as, an, overall, as, a, as a, an overwhelming layer uh, to that debate. And this brings to the reality that in the EU, the system is free of costs for producers. So they manage to put together their resources to identify a product that, in their view, it's unique because of the origin and because of the characteristics linked to that origin. They introduce a file uh, to the national level and then to the EU level, and then if the file is successful, uh, they get protection. And that entire process that I've described in three words, it's for free. Mm. And it's for free not only to be registered, but it's for free, at least to, to some extent, to get that right enforced. Uh, because given the uh, policy choice that has been made at a certain point in time in the EU, that those rights deserve the consideration of being a public good in a way, uh, their enforcement is not done uh, by lawyers uh, paid a thousand of dollars per hour, but it's done by public authorities in the first mm -hmm. place. This does not uh, prevent the fact that certain very complex issues might be decided at a certain point in time in court. We have dozens of uh, case law cases uh, that have been finally decided in court with some expenses also for the GI holders. But the, the initial stance is that given that that right is not a private one, it's a collective one that belongs to a certain community, it belongs, it, it, it deserves a certain favor as compared to other intellectual property rights that are considered private ones. Mm. Uh, mm. So, and stemming from from that uh, assumption that we are talking about a collective right that is identified as a public good, you explain the fact that uh, as an official, I spent the last 10 years of my time fighting for those rights uh, internationally, uh, as many of my colleagues, uh, because we believe that 
in those rights, there is not only uh, the interest of some producers, but more fundamentally uh, a recognition of, uh, of a public good, of a co collective right that identifies strong cultural values that are cherished by the EU citizens as a whole in a, in, in, in a general manner. Ramondo, are you able to provide examples where, particularly for indigenous groups or communities, where those rights uh, have been, um, let me put it this way, they have been enforced and, they, and there have been penalties as a result of the fact that those rights may have been transgressed. Are you able to provide any examples, particularly for indigenous communities and other FTAs with geographical indicators that you have done? Um, frankly speaking, I'm not able to provide any uh, essential link between indigenous communities and uh, those rights. But indeed, uh, as I said, uh, most of the geographical indications are extremely local, very local. Uh, according to our studies, uh, more than 60% uh, uh, of the geographical indications are consumed locally. So they do not transcend even the, sometimes the regional boundaries and uh, uh, often the national boundaries and only in 25% of those GIs, uh, you have uh, an international dimension attached to it. Those are the most iconic ones, um, but they became iconic because they have been protected. Um, and this is uh, the fundamental point of uh, being protected. Uh, if you are protected in a market uh, or even globally, uh, your product has the opportunity to, to grow, to grow in reputation, to grow in uh, 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 price point, and then to, to become, what I said, a local product, uh, a product that started very locally, and then uh, it, went, it, it went global. Um, the blah bread that I just mentioned uh, is, is one of them. Uh, it, before being recognized as a geographical indication, there were just two bakeries in Wartford continuing to produce that bread. Now there is an entire industry in that locality in Ireland that is exporting uh, to Europe uh, bread, which is a very, very basic commodity. Uh, that it belongs to uh, every one of us uh, as a as a as a food as a food staple. Mm. Um, so we have we have hundreds of little stories uh, of products that were almost disappeared, and then thanks to the geographical protection, the geographical indication protection, they were sheltering away from competition. Uh, but when I said competition, I should have probably also used the word uh, uh, counterfeiting. Uh, and then, thanks to that protection, they were able to grow and to become prosperous and adults instead of being killed in the egg. And you also see, Romando, don't you, uh, uh, an increase in the value of those products as well, don't you? A, a higher level of value uh, ascribed to those products as well. You, do you see that as well? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, the, that's the story of most of them. Uh, they were, at the very beginning, products like others. And then when they started to get reputation, because of the inherent rarity of products that are grown and uh, or produced in a specific, a specific region, and the eternal law of supply and demand, the price tag goes up. Uh, sometimes uh, some, someone can also say, uh, too high, uh, but that's for consumers to decide. Uh, but that's for sure that prices that products like champagne can uh, afford uh, internationally, they are essentially linked to the, the ability of uh, winemakers in that region of, of France to build a reputation around the name 
and to make it a luxury product. Mm. Uh, this can only be obtained if there is just one Champagne around the world, which is the one that comes from the region of Champagne in mm. France. If everybody can use the term Champagne to identify whatever sparkling wine, then your luxury product is gone forever. Lanel, could we see it in the, the potential for Aotearoa geographical indicators to be used by non-Māori? If they are part of that community, then they will have the right to use that geographical indicator on their product, that, you know, that particular product. Um, but the, I guess the goal here is, well, I shouldn't say the goal, but, but the, there's an opportunity for communities in particular regions to band together and, you know, regulate themselves, figure out what that, what that, what that GI looks like, and then, you know, determine what, 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 the, what the criteria are. Uh, and be able to move forward in that way. And, and that's really what I think is the exciting opportunity for our uh, rural communities um, in Aotearoa. Is there the potential for an overseas operator to have a geographical indicator? That's not from a, yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, and um, and I mean, it's, it's not the same like a, um, if we look at... Um, Trademarks where you can just register a trademark in, in, in any country. It's quite different. It's a, a, quite a different structure and different regime. Um, you have to demonstrate that, that um, not only does the product link to that geographical point, but their name does. Um, and so if the name is not from uh, that particular geographical region, then uh, they will not be able to use it. So therefore, Māori names should not be able to be used by overseas organisations. There was an interesting sentence you had in your report, in the Tatamata report. You said that New Zealand is a net importer of intellectual property. Does the geographical indicators provide the opportunity potentially for that to decrease and for the increase in intellectual property development in New Zealand? No, is the short answer. Wow. I think um, there's quite a lot of change that needs to happen in the New Zealand economy for us to turn that around, that statistic around. Uh, you know, we need to be creating intellectual property, um, protecting intellectual property, and then taking that overseas, um, exporting it overseas, and, and creating commercial benefits from it. Uh, and and that's, that's a long way ahead uh, for New Zealand. Uh, but the, I guess the opportunity with GIs is that it does um, provide a different framework that we can perhaps put more of our cultural uh, property and, and other um, intellectual property uh, around the country that we can't currently fit, that doesn't currently fit into the uh, current intellectual property system uh, and perhaps gain um, economic benefits and other benefits that those benefits will return to New Zealand. And provide impetus potentially for the wider development of that framework? Yes, that we've exactly, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wonder if we can, um, Romando and uh, Linnell, I hope you both are okay with me moving to some questions from those who are watching this webinar. We've got a range of questions coming in already. So uh, the first one is from Lewis, Lewis Mark, I think is the, the first name. Um, the comment is this, interesting that the EU system for geographical indicators is based on centuries of practices. Could we argue that traditional owners have the same or actual more time and traditional practices than Western systems and therefore potentially give greater advice and leadership in the development of these geographical indicators. I'll come to you, Raimondo, first. Any response to that? It's a complex, a complex question, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Um, um, Tradition, tradition is, is one element of, of the GI construction, is, is not the only one. Um, most of our GIs have a certain tradition, but this is not a requirement for, uh, for, for, for a product to be identified as a GI. Uh, the 
clear concept for geographical indication is that unique link uh, between uh, the geography and the final product. That's really the, the key feature. Um, some of our GIs and GIs internationally are based on reputation, uh, where tradition could be a component or could not be a component. So um, in that respect, GIs are not the uh, perfect solution or the only solution for traditional knowledge, but they could easily embrace the, uh, the traditional knowledge dimension. Is it, I think of Y262, mm -hmm. and uh, we're waiting for cabinet papers on Tepaitafiti as well. I mean, that, that's uh, leading us into the development of that wider framework, mm. which is not there yet, mm. right? We're still mm. waiting for responses on that. Mm. And I, I concur that, that um, the geographical indications framework will not necessarily solve all the issues that indi Indigenous people, and Māori in particular, have with the intellectual property system, but it will uh, provide another tool that um, we can rely on that aligns better with our uh, with Te Ao Māori, uh, and uh, just like all the other intellectual property rights. And um, you know, I think there's a, just an opportunity for us to explore. And I, while that while those discussions still happen, and hopefully, they will move move forward. Um, we've got a question, I think it's from Agnieszka, and if I've mispronounced your name, I apologise, who asked about examples on Indigenous GIs in Europe. I think I, I, think I um, asked that uh, question of uh, Ramondo, but I wonder, Lonelle, if you've, if you've got any other examples of potentially Indigenous geographical indicators that you might know of that have been applied? N not um, off the top of my head. I, I guess in... Some examples I, I do of, and I, I'm not sure that they are necessarily indigenous examples, come from, the, from India. And we look at you know, these examples of um, their artworks that they have specifically protected, um, some names that they have of some of their um, biodiversity, of their flora and fauna from India have been protected. And so not necessarily as GIs, but actually a, a different kind of a framework, but it does open the door for us to think about well, us it, as Māori having the opportunity to protect similar um, iconic flora and fauna products from Aotearoa that could fit into that framework. Uh, Nikki Wakefield has asked a question. Thank you, Nikki, for the question. I wonder what are the collective ownership structures of geographical indicators which we can see overseas. Do you have an example of that you could talk to us about, Ramondo? Yes, with pleasure. Um, as I said, the uh, basic principle uh, of geographic communication is the one that we call right of use. So anyone that is able to satisfy the broad specification of a given GI is allowed by law to use the term. And Beyond that simple principle, then you have realities, realities that differ in the EU based on uh, the geography uh, and on the tradition. Um, the country that I know the best, Italy, has a, a structure which is called consortia of protection. And those consortia essentially put together producers uh, or users of the name in order to defend and promote the term at stake. Uh, in uh, uh, Spain, you have uh, a similar structure which is called uh, a regulatory council, uh, which gives the rule for a given product before and during the protection. Um, in France, uh, which is another uh, country where uh, GIs are very prominent, um, you have a similar structure to the consortia or to the re regulatory council. All are extremely local and uh, uh, they respond to the communities that are uh, at the very end uh, the owners of the product. Um, 
So it's a, it's a rather diversified structure, uh, having behind the same basic concept that no one owns the GI, uh, but the communities own them. Think of uh, corporations, fund our businesses really a lot like Cornwall and the like are those the similar structures that are being referred to here I, I mean absolutely I think they can definitely function uh, as, as a community-based organization to lead a, or own a, a geographical indicator uh, but there's a real opportunity for us to you know uh, adopt you know a whanau, hapu or iwi based structure that you know that aligns with that particular geographical indicator, and, and that, that's what I think is, is quite exciting. Mm. Oh, here we go. Manuka honey. Um, this is a big issue in Aotearoa, Ramonda. I'll, I'll ask Linnell about this one. And if you've got any thoughts, feel free to supply them. Um, Linnell, would manuka honey qualify as a geographical indication? What are the complexities of this? There's lots We've got a half hour, by the way. <laughs> There's, um, I mean, there's lots of complexities with that, and it originates because manuka has been unregulated for so long, and so as a consequence, you know, we have uh, a number of issues that have developed. Uh, you know, there's an Australian manuka honey association has developed uh, in Australia, uh, and you know, we haven't developed all of those um, systems and regulations that sit behind when and how you can use the name Manuka Honey. Uh, and so if we look at first principles, Manuka is a Māori word from a geographical region uh, called Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and our Manuka Honey has special characteristics um, and unique flavours. And, and, and like, so in theory, yes, it should be able to be a geographical indication. Um, and so but at the same time, the, we need to deal with these competing interests. Uh, and if we look back at some of the examples that Raimondo talked about, you know, those industries didn't ha they had to deal with these counterfeiters as well at some point. And so that's what we will have to deal with to get this, um, this over the line for Manuka. Ramondo, perhaps I can bring you in here on this part of the conversation around how do you deal with the quote-unquote counterfeiters. Uh, because it is a part of the registration process, and registrations uh, can be set aside, can, can, can be neglected. How do you deal with that aspect of the registration process as one goes through the geographical indicators? Are you still there, Ramondo? Sorry. Yes, I was just muted. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Um, I was about to say that indeed uh, that uh, angle, the one of uh, uh, counterfeiting or, or use of a term, it's an essential part of the GI process. Uh, GIs are intellectual property rights uh, and their protection should be based on an objection procedure. Uh, on uh, the possibility for any stakeholder to um, object to the protection of those terms that once they are protected, they impede uh, competition or they impede the use by non-qualified users. So it's very essential in, in that discussion that everybody is given the possibility to object. At the same time, uh, it is the history of the protection in the EU, but also uh, the protection of UGIs internationally, is that uh, often, some GIs, in particular the most famous ones, uh, face, uh, I wouldn't use the term uh, uh, counterfeiting, but the use by, by, by other entities of certain terms that uh, have a certain meaning uh, in certain territories. And uh, and this is why it's particularly essential uh, to conduct uh, such an operation of uh, objection only and exclusively on a territorial basis. Uh, you cannot uh, derive from the fact that uh, a GI is given protection 
in a certain territory, the debt protection extends to other territories. And by the same token, you cannot derive from the fact that uh, there is use or, or counterfeiting of a certain GI in another territory which is not the country of origin, that that GI became generic worldwide. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a very complex uh, part of the discussion. It's part of any FTA discussion that we have with our partners. I believe it's also part of uh, um, the Maori problems uh, with uh, uh, the protection of Manu Kahani, uh, is that the more you uh, uh, wait uh, before you get the protection, the more there is a risk that your term starts to be used by anyone everywhere. And uh, then the, uh, the battle becomes uh, an uphill battle, sometimes impossible to win. Mm. Uh, because, as I said, there is a need to, to ensure a fair uh, objection process uh, when you try to protect uh, a GI, which equals to uh, make it exclusive to certain users okay. against others. Okay. It was a very good answer. I'm sticking to the part where Lanell said, in theory, it's possible, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh Nikki Wakefield is very active. Thank you, Nikki, for the questions that we're receiving from you. Um, Nikki asks, talking about indigenous and endemic species which may be used in GIs, can a geographical indicator restrict the commercial use to the endemic localities of the species? I'll come to you first, Rondo, if you can help with that one. Um, th that's another trick one. Um, in general, uh, GIs uh, cannot be uh, established when you have something which is an animal breed or, uh, uh, or a vegetal um, uh, species. Um, that's because in, let's say, in, in, in theory, those species or those animal breeds uh, can uh, trespass the original uh, uh, cradle uh, where they have been uh, developed and be used by anybody uh, in any territory. That's, that, that, that's the theory. Then uh, this deserves... Uh, case-by-case case assessment, uh, but according, let's say, to well-established TRIPS standards, uh, so international standards on uh, intellectual property rights, uh, protection cannot be given, for example, to something which is uh, a grey variety, uh, because a grey variety, uh, by definition, can and shall be used by any potential wine grower uh, around the world. Then there might be a disagreement on what is a great variety, but that's, a, that's another set of the debate. Um, at the same time, there is a strong link sometimes between a variety and a place. And we have hundreds of uh, GIs in the EU where you have an association of a given name of a given variety, of a plant, for example, in association uh, with a specific origin. Try to make uh, an example on top of my mind. Uh, let's take the wine, the, the wine, uh, the, the wine example. Um, in my region, uh, there is a, a grey variety, which is well repute, which is called Vermentino. This is the name of the grey variety. And this cannot be subject to GI as such. But when you use uh, the term of the geographical, uh, so, sorry, of the, of the plant variety, of, in this case of the grape variety, in conjunction with the geographical name, so Vermentino di Sardegna, Vermentino from Sardinia, then you have a GI. So we don't pretend in Sardinia to have the monopoly on the term Vermentino, but we do pretend, because this has been given a GI, that there is a monopoly on the term where there is an association of the plant variety plus the geographical indication. The conjunction of it, the compound, as you call it, makes it a GI. Kapoi. Thank you for that. Um, anything to add, Lina? Uh, no, I agree. Yep. Kapoi. Um, 
Well, you answered the bit, Ramondo, around who regulates, that there is, there is an authority. Um, who prosecutes in the case where there might be counterfeiters of geographical indicators? Um, in the EU system, at the very end, it's court that decides. Um, but the entire GI system is built around the concept of the burden of the proof being on the shoulders of the user that pretends to use the GI when it is not qualified to use it. Uh, so there is a, an inversion of the burden of the proof, which is specific to that particular right. So if a GI holder, let's say a consortium in the Italian example, goes to the public authority and says, there is one user using my term that I know is not conforming to the specifications, then the authorities, they go in the market and they say the product. Then up to the uh, user to uh, show that the GI holders were wrong and this might, have, might end up in court uh, and at the very end, uh, judges are there to 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 strike a final a final decision. Lanelle, any issues you see coming out of that? Uh, I, well, what I would like to see in, in Aotearoa New, Zeal New Zealand is um, we have our Commerce Commission, which regulates our markets and uh, you know deals with the Fair Trading Act, which which um, prevents misleading and deceptive behaviour. And I'd like to see that commission sort of take on that role as the enforcer, and um, you know, so therefore it, it does it is free for potentially free for um, owners of geographical indicators, New Zealand geographical indicators, to enforce their GIs. Because one of the things we did say in our report was that you know Māori will need to be funded to engage with this in the system without a doubt. You know. Uh, Ramondo explained that the GI system in Europe has been around since the 90s. Um, so we're coming at this on the back foot. Um, so we're going to need to be supported uh, both financially and you know, from advisors on how to engage um, so that we can engage uh, if we do sign up to the free trade, uh, the, that's right. the that's, GI that's framework. Right throughout the whole process. Throughout, right? the, throughout whole the whole process. Whole registration process. Yeah. So would you like to see the Commerce Commission essentially as the as a prosecutorial authority, but what about the authority which receives the registrations? What should that look like in the New Zealand context? Is it the same or different? Oh, I, I mean, I think there does need to be, well, we have our intellectual property office yep. that, that already receives geographical indication applications for wines and spirits. So that would make sense that they receive those um, those applications moving forward. But I do think there is scope for a government organisation to take on some responsibility around enforcement. Uh, and I, I think that applies even now for traditional knowledge and misuse. You know, in my view, that organisation should be should have some role to play um, in supporting protection of our traditional knowledge and cultural heritage. And the reason I say that is we see it in Australia, you know, the equivalent organisation there, the ACCC, they do do that. You know, they do take actions against organisations that misuse Australian artworks um, in Australia, so or Australian Indigenous artworks, I should say. Are you able to tell us how many uh, Māori issues, Māori claims that have been lodged with the Intellectual Property Office in New Zealand? Has there been many? Have uh, with, under the GI yeah. framework, I, I don't think there's been any. Um, but that, that, that is for wine and beer, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. wine and spirits, yes. Yeah. Wine and spirits, um, sorry. So you would need to have a, um, a geographical name that's a Māori name, um, and that indicates wine from a particular region that has particular characteristics, um, and there hasn't been any filed, any Māori names filed. There have been... Um, uh, you know, like Marlborough is registered as a GI, Central Otago uh, for wines from those regions. Gisborne is another one, uh, but no Māori names yet. Right, and how representative would the office need to be or how informed would it need to be and how would that process work in terms of Māori rights and interests? How, how, how should that go how should that work? The office, um, and, and they have admitted this themselves, that they do need to build up their capability in... Um, 
the space and traditional knowledge space, uh, and so they will also need to do it in in the GI space for this for this exact reason that we've talked about. Okay, um, we've got another question from Paul. Kia ora, Paul. Thank you so much for the question. There are a number of technologies, including New Zealand grown trust codes, to help combat counterfeiting. Trust codes work with the Fernmark program, for example. Can these codes or blockchain systems be used to verify geographical indicators? I, I might come to you first, Linda, if you've got any insight and then hand oh. over to Ramada. I don't know how the trust codes work. I'm, <laughs> I apologise. But um, I definitely think there is scope to, for that to be part of the verification process. And I think that would be part of that... Um, us building up our knowledge around uh, in, in the geographical indication space, we would have to look at these technologies and see if they can help with this process. You know, there's also um, biocultural labelling. There's other um, technologies out there that we could possibly use, and, and that sounds like that could be a good one as well. Mm. Okay, very good. Ramondo, do you want to add anything there? You may be able to bring some other experience, obviously, given the trade, free trade agreement sorry, that the EU has undertaken. More on the on the internal regime that internationally, we know that some uh, GIs have been developing the use of blockchain uh, uh, as a, a as a very powerful uh, uh, manner to to enforce their rights. Um, this is specific to GIs having certain uh, means and ways uh, to protect uh, their rights. It's not definitely uh, widespread as a as a feature for, for GIs. But yes, I do believe that this is a, this is a, a way uh, to ensure authenticity of certain products. Um, but first and foremost, this is a problem that you have when you have a right. Uh, in these specific uh, circumstances, uh, the use is trying to establish rights in New Zealand that are still not yet there. It's... Um... 11.15ish, our time, uh, Ramondo. Uh, I think what I might do is ask just um, both our guest speakers and presenters uh, to make some concluding remarks, if that's OK. Anything else that you both um, want to add? Perhaps I can start with you, Ramondo. I would like to pick up uh, a word that has been used by Linnell yourself more than once, which is the one of opportunity. Um, I really believe that uh, in this FTA, the EU is, uh, uh, while trying to pursue its legitimate uh, uh, commercial interests, not trying to um, export the EU regime into New Zealand. Uh, this is not something uh, that we believe being the right approach. The right approach for us is uh, along uh, the pursuit of our, uh, the pursuit of our uh, economic interests. Uh, the fact that this FTA gives uh, New Zealand, in the first place, an opportunity uh, to uh, reflect and to consider the opportunity to establish uh, a fresh uh, regime uh, for geographical indications on top of the existing ones uh, for wines and spirits. Uh, that debate belongs entirely uh, to the New Zealand citizens, including uh, the treaty parties. Um, and um, I'm rather sure that uh, little by little, um, other um, countries that traditionally had uh, a rather reluctant stance vis-a-vis -vis GIs will embrace the concept, uh, which is definitely, and not from now, but already since a number of decades, not an EU concept, but a concept that uh, went global and that has been successfully proved uh, in, many corners of, uh, in many corners of the globe. Thank you, Romando, for those comments. Linnell, I'll hand over to you to make some concluding remarks. I think um, one of the issues we will face is, you know, this is another intellectual property system that could be considered that it's been imposed on us as a consequence of a free trade agreement, which, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, some aspects to that that, that that are true. But I, 
I, I mean, I work in the intellectual property system uh, area. I understand the benefits of intellectual property and how that can benefit our people um, by creating economic wealth, which enables then us to achieve our other goals. So I really see GIs as uh, an opportunity. Sorry to say that word again, but um, I do think it is an opportunity for our communities and our communities to, um, you know, create industries within their own community. Um, you know, reach back and, and um, into our traditional knowledge and, and use that as a as a tool to lead that community into the future. Um, I know that that. Some of the things we've talked about, it does sound like there's a lot of work and it will be a lot of work, but I think there, there are some significant benefits that for our small communities and um, that for me is really exciting. Thank you both uh, very much, Linnell and Romando. Really, Romando, thank you for joining us from uh, Brussels. Uh, we wish you all the very best and we really thank you for joining us from there. Romando, Sarah, European Commission Directorate General for Agriculture and also Linnell Tuffrey Hudia, Indigenous Law and Intellectual Property Expert from AJ Park. Thank you both very much. And thank you all very much for joining and tuning in uh, to this webinar. We really appreciate, appreciate you all making your time really to tune in, uh, to listen to what I think has been a very informative uh, session. And thank you very much to those uh, question makers for raising the questions to our expert presenters and speakers uh, today. It is, as I say, a very important kaupapa, uh, and an important kaupapa for Tiwi Māori. Nā reira kia kahara tātou, ki te te tiro ki ene i kōrero, ki te ene i kaupapa, ko matapakihia, ko wete wete kina, i rō toinga mini ti tata a ke nei. Don't forget, we will be making a video recording of this webinar available on a couple of platforms, YouTube and Facebook pages, uh, and the like, so you can have a review back of this webinar session uh, after it concludes. Kia noho ngā mana ki tanga, o te manu ta afi o rangi me tana ta makotahi me te rimo te huia, ki runga, kia koutou katoa, te hewa maure o rakea tātou katoa. <laughs>